Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the, um, our next installment of the Auschwitz Speaker Series, offered in conjunction with the exhibition Auschwitz Not Long Ago, Not Far Away. My name is Jessica Rockhold, and I'm the Executive Director of the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education. And it's really my privilege to welcome you tonight and uh, invite you to learn with us once again. On behalf of our partners at Union Station Kansas City, uh, MCHE wants to thank you for all of the support that you've shown, not only for the exhibition, but for this um, series of speakers and the learning that we hope you're gaining from that. If you haven't joined us over the last few speakers, you may have missed the first presentation by Dr. Fran Sternberg. Um, Fran is affiliated with the University of Kansas Jewish, Study Pro Jewish Studies Program, where she teaches a range of Jewish history courses. Uh, it's modern Jewish history, medieval and early modern. She teaches the Holocaust. She teaches Hitler and Nazi Germany. But her particular area of interest and her own dissertation research is about Polish Jewry in the interwar period. And that's her topic here with us tonight. And I have to tell you that as my friend and my former colleague, I've heard Fran speak about this so many times, so passionately about this. And no matter how many times I have had the opportunity to hear this, I always learn something new. So thank you for joining us. And um, I'm going to turn it over to Fran so she can share this with all of you. Okay. Um, well, hi everybody. And thank you very much, Jessica, for that good introduction. I always hope I live up to it. Uh, and thank you, Shelley, also for having me here. Um, and thank you all of you for coming to hear this talk. Uh, basically, uh, before I start, a couple of pieces of housekeeping, so to speak, actually one piece. And that is that when I open the PowerPoint, you will notice that there's a lot of text in it. There's also a lot of pictures, um, but I very much want you not to think about having to read the text. Uh, since this will be shown on YouTube, if you're so inclined, uh, you can always go back and read the text. Uh, but I just wanted to let you know about that. So let me just share my screen. Now, um, as I said, uh, this, uh, as, as Jessica said, I should say, uh, this presentation is going to be about Polish Jews between the two wars. And a, a portion of this uh, was the subject of my dissertation. I studied two Polish towns, small towns, Szczepla, as they're called, to distinguish them from larger towns or cities, in the Bialystok province of Poland between the two wars. And the title of my dissertation was Cities with Boundless Possibilities, which is a kind of odd title, but it's very meaningful. I came across it in a Yiddish newspaper uh, from one of the towns, a weekly Yiddish newspaper that was published. Uh, and they mentioned ironically, uh, it's a quote, sort of a paraphrase of a quote from Maxim Gorky, who was a, a Russian writer of the interwar period. And um, he meant it uh, facetiously a little bit too about Russia and the Soviet Union and the possibilities in the Soviet Union. And the people in the Yiddish newspaper that I was looking at, Velka Visker Leben, it was called Velka Visker Life. Um, they too said, well, we live, and they're talking about the Jews, the Polish Jews in interwar Poland, in cities of boundless possibilities. And they meant it really in two ways, um, either very ironically and facetiously, because look at how we live under certain restrictions and difficulties, as I'll explain to you. Uh, and then also, the fact is that there is some potential here. And this is how I see Polish Jewry between the wars, very much as I'm going to tell you, a work in progress. Well, let me go to the next slide. And so the way I'm going to put this together is in three parts. Uh, first, context, which is like the backstory to all of this. And then contours, which will be the um, actual formulation of how everything looked and was with lots of pictures and whatnot. And then finally, conclusions. Uh, but let's start with the context. So the backstory. In order to understand interwar Polish Jews, there are a few things we need to understand about how we see them and how we think about them and what they were and in what situation they found themselves in the interwar period, what larger situation. But we have to start with perception. Um, the problem with studying interwar Jews generally in Europe is the Holocaust. You literally have to go through the Holocaust, almost like through a tunnel, into that world. The problem, though, is we live on the other side of the Holocaust. And so our perception of these 
communities, be they Jewish or be they Polish or German, um, whatever, French, whatever, uh, really um, is colored by this perception of horror. We look at it and the horrific way in which this community came apart and Polish Jews suffered grievous losses out of three and a quarter million Jews before the war, uh, less than 300,000 survived fewer than 300,000, way fewer. And so the losses this community sustained, the utterness with which it was destroyed, uh, really colors our perception. Uh, it's almost like the ax is always hanging over them. The Edge of Destruction, as one book titled, A Study of Interwar Polish Jews. Uh, the other thing we also have, and this is a, a function of how East European Jews are looked at generally, is this nostalgia we always seem to, that always seems to cover, color this subject. Um, you see it in Fiddler on the Roof, which is a very nostalgic take and, and really a fake nostalgic take, fake take um, on the very edgy kind of stories that Shalom Aleichem wrote that formed the basis of Fiddler on the Roof. But we have this nostalgia for this very harmonious past, a, a past that was filled with this kind of amorphous Yiddish kind, this cozy Jewish feeling, Jewishness. Uh, cozy customs and, and cute picturesque ways of dealing with each other. Um, and, and this is not just a kind of pop art perception as you see these uh, very much for sale prints that um, are, are done by this Ukrainian uh, born Israeli artist. Uh, and look at what he titles his series of paintings. By the way, you can go on the internet and buy these. Um, it's called uh, Wandering Stars, World, Comma, Gone with the Holocaust. This is not the world that was gone with the Holocaust. It's a very different world, but there is this need to see, just like A.J. Heschel, who is a, a well-known scholar, says the little Jewish communities of Eastern Europe were like sacred texts open before the eyes of God. As if everybody living on the cusp of the Holocaust was a sacred text, was imbued with this kind of heightened parochial spirituality an infinite world of inwardness. And he's not writing this about, again, the world of the turn of the 20th century, the 1890s. He's writing this about the Jews in the interwar period. Similarly, you see this, again, another perception that seem, somehow seems to go along with this. And here I quote Lucy Davidovich, or use part of a quote from her, a world that is always seen as frozen in not just utter piety, but also utter poverty. And here we come to a series of photographs by Roman Vishniak. Now, I'm sure many of you are familiar with these. Um, his first big coffee table book hit was called A Vanished World. You see it down there. It came out in 1983, though it may have come out before then. I think that might be the paperback date. But in any case, uh, he very consciously, and he's a very sophisticated guy. He comes from St. Petersburg, you know, before the Russian Revolution. He's lived in America. He goes to France all the time. He's very conversant with continental culture, generally speaking, very sophisticated, a phenomenal photographer. And he consciously going to Europe, going to Poland in 38 and 39 and taking reams of photographs for his first book, chooses 31 photographs. And he says it's here, not just because they're so fabulous and they are, he's a great photographer, um, but because he saw this as typical Jewish life, abjectly poor in its material condition and in spiritual condition, exaltedly religious. And I've, I've labeled all these studies, Warsaw, Sloan, and whatever, whatever. Um, I could show you, I'm going to show you other pictures of Warsaw. And so maybe right next to these people, those other pictures existed too, but he consciously presents them this way. And it comes down to us too. This we think is authenticity. Well, it isn't. Because in reality, Polish Jews, interwar Polish Jews, were a very complex, diverse society, not frozen, but moving, dynamic, not living in one set of identities, but constructing a variety of identities, and many of them in conflict with each other. And that said, they have a very long history in that region. Um, it's absolutely correct to consider the region in which Poland finds itself, Polish Jewry find themselves. It's a much larger region, as you see on this slide. Um, it really is uh, essentially, it, the borders are the Dnieper River, as you see it on the, on the, on the east, and the Oder River on the west. 
uh, the Baltic Sea to the Black Sea. This was a large area before the First World War. It was part of the Russian, it was the Russian Pale, which the Jews were restricted to. And in 1939, five million Jews still lived in this territory. So fully a third of, more, almost a third of the world Jewish population still lives there. And the largest part of that population lives in Poland. Uh, and you can see on the next slide, the demographic distinctions here. And you can also see uh, basically how much larger the populations of Poland and Russia, and by here it's larger the Western Soviet Union we're talking about, um, are then the populations of the other countries. Uh, one good way of looking at it is there are as many Jews in France, in fact, there are fewer Jews in France, according to this particular demographic, than there are in Warsaw. So this gives you a sense of the size, the density, and the roots of this community. This is the Jewish heartland. And the other thing about the Jewish heartland that's so fascinating is that four communities, and here I'm lumping North American Jewry, Canadian and American Jewry together under North American Jewry, so no offense to Canadians or Americans, um, but two thirds of North American Jews more than ha almost half of the Jews in the Yeshuv, in pre-Palestine, pre um, pre-state Palestine, pre-state Israel, and one-fifth of German Jewry can trace their roots back to that heartland. And the other thing that's interesting about these three communities, the North American one, the one in the Yeshuv in Palestine, and the one in Germany, is that each in their own way can be looked at in the interwar period as taking off in different directions. And so Polish Jews, who are the largest group in the interwar period in the heartland are the very heart of the heartland. And the other thing you need to see about Polish Jews is a, a little bit of what we, again, a little bit of demography, uh, a question of age cohorts. Uh, interwar Polish Jews consist of several age cohorts. The generations that came of age in the late Russian empire, the generations that came of age in World War I, and the generations that are born and come of age, or would have come of age in the Polish Republic. And so again, we're looking at a very uh, sort of interesting set of age and social, socio-demographic considerations. Uh, this lovely family picture, for example, the extended Katz family is a lovely case in point here. You get a very nice sense of uh, just the multiple generations. So, so interwar Polish Jewry was not one age group, all those old people that Norman Vishnak seems to show you, but rather multi-generational. Go to the next slide. And then we have the Republic of Poland, which is another work in progress. And this is an important thing to keep in mind. Um, uh, Poland doesn't exist for about 120, give or take years. In the 18th century, the end of the 18th century, from 1772 on, uh, between 1772 and 1795, it was divided, basically partitioned, among three different empires, um, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the German Empire, and the Russian Empire. Uh, and then it was only after World War I, in the context of Versailles and the settlements after World War I, that it became a republic again. And so here is the Polish Republic in 1933. It was a diverse republic because when it was put together at Versailles, it was clear that Poland was going to contain more than just a Polish ethnic majority. There would be significant other ethnic minorities, which were called the national minorities. Uh, and so in order for Poland even to get its independence or to be recognized as an independent power, by the um, powers of their side that crafted all of these settlements after the First World War, they had to agree to, not just in the Treaty of Versailles, but also in the National Minorities Treaty that they had to sign separately, to preserve the independence autonomy and respect the differences of the significant national minorities that were in, encompassed within their borders. And that it was not just giving them equal civil rights, 
They also were allowed to keep their own languages, to have schools that are accredited in their own languages, and also to elect their own representatives to all of the different types of government, state, municipal, whatever, whatever. So they were allowed to maintain a discrete identity. If they chose, should they not choose it, they could obviously accept more of a level of what was called pollinization. So this is the situation. And I have some figures here, you can see them. Jews are a significant ethnic minority. They're either the second largest or the third largest, how, how you want to, well, according to the census as they come out this way, but they're often called the second largest ethnic minority. But even the third largest ethnic minority is a significant size. And roughly the Polish Jewish population translates out to anywhere between eight and 10% of the population. The other little piece of context that you need to have is war. Uh, no sooner, in fact, even sooner before uh, the um, uh, Republic, the Polish Republic was put together or consolidated, it was already embroiled in two or three wars that broke out or were continuing situation um, on these Eastern, on, on, on its Eastern frontier. Uh, and as you can see, the Ukrainian Soviet War doesn't uh, apply to us today, but the Polish Ukrainian War and the Polish Soviet War were two wars that involved attempts to first uh, bring back, you know, undo the Russian Revolution by certain sets of armies. Uh, also, it had to do with border disputes between the Soviet Union and Poland and the Soviet Ukraine and Poland. So this is a, a kind of very difficult situation that goes on for a few years. Um, and most of the fighting takes place exactly where most of the Jews live in that heartland area. And in fact, there is a certain significant amount of violence with respect to Jews. The Jews are caught in the crossfire of everyone, including Polish non-Jews, the Polish army and so on. If they're going into territories that the Soviets have and they want to take from the Soviets then the Jews are considered inimical. Um, and so it's an interesting situation because uh, the Jews are caught in this crossfire and there's quite a bit of violence extended to Jews. Now, that said, Jewish soldiers, Jewish young men fight with the Polish army because they are very much concerned with maintaining or making sure Poland survives because the alternatives would be worse going back to Russia, which is way worse. And so, and they were, you know, this was a very important thing for them. And so one of the things that, you know, you need to understand is that young men were conscripted and they went and they fought. And in point of fact, young Jewish men fight or, you know, are part of the Polish military structure as, you know, infantrymen, as officers, whatever, uh, right throughout the interwar period. If you were to go into a home, a Jewish home in the interwar period, uh, you would see pictures of boys in uniform. So again, this is an important thing to keep in mind. And these are wonderful pictures, as you can see. Um, the one I call your attention to is the one on the lower right-hand side of Tuvia Bielski, who is the uh, head of the Bielski Partisans. If you've seen the film Defiance with Daniel Craig, that's the Daniel Craig. Um, but in any case, you know, just a little piece of thing to know. Uh, so again, and Jewish communities were also very supportive of the survival of the Polish Republic and of their young men in uniform. And so they came out officially to support their young men. Uh, and then, of course, finally, the Republic consolidates. And here hangs the tail tip. Uh, for the first four years, it's a typical parliamentary democracy modeled on France, you know, yada, yada, multi-party, all that stuff. Um, and then, of course, this is a very unsettled period, even in the wake of these, the ending of these wars. Uh, and so, there's a great deal of factional strife, political fragmentation. Um, there's significant economic problems. And in 1926, Poland, basically, there's a, a change in Poland's structure. A man named Joseph Pilsudski, Marshal Pilsudski, a hero, a war hero, um, basically gets control of the government. Uh, he leads a coup and he's supported by the left, the more progressive liberals, you know, so to speak, and um, also by the national minorities, because again, uh, the factional strife that had broken out did not 
help the national minorities. It, it actually undermined their positions of the Jews and so on. And also more progressive elements were the target of some of this political fragmentation and actual rioting and violence as well. And so his coup, which uh, he called, uh, he, this policy he calls sanatia, which sounds like sanitation, but actually means healing. Um, basically, uh, people were behind it. And for a period of time, this was very positive and there was a sort of very positive spirit. But again, further economic and social problems or perhaps the same unsolved ones. Uh, this is just a course in Polish history. Uh, basically meant he became more authoritarian and uh, tended to then put a certain level of restriction on opposition and, you know, activism and so on and so forth. Um, and increasingly one party became the prime party. Uh, and right before he dies in, 1930, in, in 1935, uh, the people who were obviously his successors, you know, the people his has chosen, uh, had already started putting together what I call a demi-authoritarian constitution. Uh, not quite half authoritarian, but certainly strong authoritarian overtones. And this continued, of course, until everything came to an end in 29. And so then we come to anti-Semitism, which is uh, another, another thing that, you know, obviously we need to address. Uh, to say that anti-Semitism doesn't exist would be wrong. Uh, it was never non-existent in the Polish Republic. But here we come to the kind of reasoning I like to do, which is uh, kind of on the one hand, on the other hand. Uh, definitely the kind of anti-Semitism that exists keeps Jews from truly first class membership in the state, as I say here in the text. Um, and the National Barriers Treaty had a lot of holes in it, uh, and it wasn't always absurd. Uh, and it isn't like the Western powers are going to come after Poland to make them observe it. Uh, so basically, now Pilsudski, who saw all of these extreme opinions as essentially inherently dangerous to the state generally, because it allows a lot of loose cannons to run around, uh, was able to control it. But after that, things somewhat changed. But even more importantly, he doesn't stop political parties from advocating anti-Semitism or periodicals from advocating anti-Semitism or movements to um, that advocate anti-Semitism to exist. He doesn't stop that. Uh, and after his death, things become much more difficult. Uh, and certainly the new government, particularly in the wake of the Great Depression, which Poland suffered from very grievously, uh, try to respond to some of the economic problems of the Great Depression by essentially limiting the Jews economic viability. And I'll explain what that means later. You'll see exactly what I mean. Uh, but that said, the other thing you need to understand is on the other hand, it's not monolithic. This isn't Nazi Germany. And you have to see that in comparison because it, it's very different. Um, it varies time, it varies according to place. In some places it's stronger, in some places it's weaker. At some period, for example, the 20s, it was less strong. In the 30s, it got stronger, particularly after Pilsudski's death, when more uh, right-wing nationalist exclusivistic uh, attitudes began to prevail. Um, it was more marked in the West and Central provinces where there are fewer Jews, uh, less marked where Jews live more Jews live, which is in the eastern provinces, and where fewer Poles live. So again, we can see some of where that skews. Um, but that said, there is certainly anti-Semitic articulation, as you can see from this particular magazine cover. Uh, typical, stereotypical Jews, Jews out, uh, and uh, pass this on. Um, and as I said, over the course of the 30s particularly, you see the emergence of anti-Semitic regulations, regulating Jewish economic activity, uh, regulating, even attempting to regulate Jewish municipal governments, i.e. the community governments, the uh, Kahillas, as they're called, the Jewish community councils. Um, also exclusion of Jews in various kinds of jobs, the civil service, which meant that many lawyers couldn't uh, get government jobs from many of the state-run hospitals. Uh, and you can see a whole raft of things going on here. Um, as I said, you can look at some of this, you know, if you want to come back later and, and look at it on YouTube, you can get a better sense of all the explanations I've put on here. But here you see, for example, the, uh, the push to boycott Jewish businesses. Um, and you have this great, uh, it says, this pig buys from Jews. 
it's a boycott sign. And, it, and, and, and interestingly enough, this is in one of those provinces where there are fewer Jews and more Poles. Um, there are also anti-Semitic regulations with respect to education, which always gets the most play. Uh, because as you will see, Jewish young people, are, you know, th there's a real push for education um, for a variety of reasons, as we're going to see. And so you start seeing either de facto or de jure discrimination against Jewish students in secondary schools, the gymnasia and the lyceums, and also in the universities and the professional schools. There are even ghetto benches, which means that these are things where uh, ghetto benches are uh, these, uh, when Jews come to class, Jewish students come to class, uh, basically uh, these ghetto benches mean that they cannot sit with all the other students. They have to sit in designated areas. And many students, what they would do is to stand in the back the whole time during all the lectures. Um, and you can see this, uh, you know, this got great play everywhere. Uh, people didn't take it lying down. There were many protests, but there are also protests the other ways. You can see here, uh, this is in, I think, Lviv, Poland. I think it's Lviv. Um, where the Jews say we demand, what, not the Jews, uh, the, there's a protest, it's a technical school and it, a protest, you know, a, like an MIT type school. Um, and uh, they want an official ghetto. By that they mean the seating ghettos. And you can see here the stamp on this young man's identity card where he's got, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, he's got the ghetto bench stamp right on his student ID card. Um, there's also violence. And again, you have to be careful about this violence. It's definitely there. It's much broader based and much more violent, much more brutal uh, in that period leading up to the formation of the Republic. It's, uh, then there's sporadic violence for a couple of years in 35 to 37, which is almost like the height of this kind of anti-Semitic expression in Poland. Again, not that it goes away, but it, it's the height of it. Um, and then uh, you also have uh, the Pshitic pogrom, which is a, very much a part of this period of 35 to 37 violence. Uh, and I've got the whole story here as what happens. Uh, but the thing that's interesting too, is that part of it has to do with the fact that there's a Jewish self-defense group. And so again, it's, it's a very complicated situation here. Uh, but, and, and after Pshitic, and once everything is, you know, once basically there's a trial of, uh, Jews, 14 Jews and 42 non-Jews who are arrested during these incredibly escalating riots where several people are killed, uh, three people are killed and, and many are wounded. Um, there's a trial and uh, if you look at the sentences, they're not particularly fair in any way, uh, but it seems to have put the damper on much further violence. And so you don't see much of it after that. Uh, Mordechai Gebirtig, a very famous poet, he did not survive the Holocaust, um, wrote a poem, uh, Our Shtetl is Burning, where he was, he used the Shittic pogrom, he was riffing off the Shittic pogrom, um, because he was trying to draw attention to the idea of Jews needing to constantly be, you know, coping with these issues, otherwise they could bring our, our community down. And these are some people who had suffered some of the violence in Shittic. Um, that being said, two more considerations about anti-Semitism. Number one, Polish Jews themselves understood Polish anti-Semitism, viewed it through a prism. One is, as I said, the very egregious anti-Semitism that everyone had historical memory of from the Russian Empire in the 1880s into the First World War. Secondly, the anti-Semitic violence of the period from 1927, 1917 to 1921, that period right before the Republic consolidates itself when those wars were going on, post-World War I wars. And finally also, the fact that from 33 on, they were seeing some very serious anti-Semitism in Germany, not even close to anything they had in Poland, which isn't to say that they didn't that they were gonna you know, lay down under the anti-Semitism they had in Poland, but it tempered or, or they, they had a kind of balanced view of it. And you will see that they were able to function in its context and that's an important thing to understand. Now granted, what they were going through in Poland is something that would have sent us American Jews screaming. But again, they were seeing it very differently. 
that said, another hand, a kind word for the Polish Republic, it too was a work in progress. And what's interesting about this work in progress is that even though it was nationalistic, demi-authoritarian, anti-Semitic, and overly centralized, so the central government was trying to push into too many state-related matters, provincial-related matters, it was also very free. It was and it allowed a, a significant amount of pluralistic expression. And so in that way, it was good for the Jews, at least not bad for the Jews. Because given the minorities treaty, they were allowed to open their own schools, as you're going to see. They were allowed to write what they please. They could express themselves freely as a distinct ethnic group. And the government provided a network of media, an infrastructure of media and communication that they used to propagate their own ideas. And so this is something, you know, you have to be balanced about this. Okay, now what you paid your money for, contours. So what, were the, what was the society like? Start with, I always start with demography. It's not a map, it's demography as far as I'm concerned. But let's start with demography. Look at the population. Look at their settlement patterns and so on. Okay, again, it's the second largest Jewish community in the world, one fifth of world Jewry. And in 1931, according to the census, and these numbers are always fungible, it was 3.1 million people. And in 39, it was 3.25 million people. So this is a big community in Poland. All the more so because of their settlement patterns. Um, like Jews all over Europe, as one uh, sociologist of interwar Poland, or actually of interwar jury wrote, Polish Jews are quintessentially urban. Most Polish Jews, like Jews all over Europe, live in cities. 60 to 70% live in cities and towns, especially in five towns. And these are the biggest which is say these are the biggest five towns. Everybody, the most urban, you know, the largest concentration of urban population is in these towns. Um, so 60 to 70 percent live in cities and towns. Now that, that tells you what, what you, that's fine, but you need to understand it in a different way. You have to compare the number of uh, the total population. In other words, 70%, 60 to 70% of Polish Jews live in towns. Whereas in the total terms of the total population, only 24% of the total population lives in cities and towns in 31, and 27%, not much of a larger growth, in, in 21, I'm sorry, and then in 31, 27 Now, why is this significant? Because what that means is if you go into a city like Białystok, or Krakow, or Lublin, or Częstochowa, or any of the cities I've had, got here, you would... And you know, you're coming from the countryside, you're a non-Jew coming from the countryside. You go, oh my God, this place is full of Jews. Because the bulk of Jews are concentrated in the city. So it creates a kind of top heavy effect when you see it. In fact, it's even more extreme when you go to the smaller uh, types of residency situations like villages and more importantly, shtetla. But here we have some pictures of urban Jews, very much urban. And here we have pictures of Jews living in the shtetla, in the small, the small cities. Um, 30, 30 to 40% live in that eastern area that is not necessarily Polish in ethnicity, but rather in its main non-Jewish ethnicity, Polish non-Jewish, but Ukrainian, Belarusian, and to some degree Lithuanian. Um, and there, not only do 30 to 40% of Jews live in the urban situations, so they have a small urban situation, but more importantly, some of these shtetlok, like the two I studied for my dissertation, um, were top heavy with Jews. Out of uh, eleven thousand uh, people in the town, um, in the town I studied, the Volkovisk, something like five, six thousand were Jews. When you think about that, that's quite significant. So this is the situation. Now, in terms of population, during the interwar years, the Jews, the Jewish population increases at a very high rate, at a very intense rate. Uh, 
demographers call it, demographers call it natural growth. So it experienced a high natural growth, high birth rates, large family sizes, and low infant mortality. And the impact of this was very significant because it, it was a it, it was it was it created a, a real strain on the Jewish community, on the resources it could bring to bear to help fellow Jews, and also on Jewish economic activity. On the one hand, again, Polish Jews are concentrated in these urban situations, cities, shtetl, towns. On the other hand, 90% of Polish Jews are involved in non-farm occupation. As you're gonna see, a lot of that non-farm occupation is retail activity at a very small level. And as a consequence, that puts a strain on the number of jobs available. And it creates a kind of, well, we'll see a, a kind of spreading poverty, especially as economic restrictions kick in. And in fact, when Polish, uh, Jew, when Jewish uh, social thinkers, Jewish social, you know, people involved in social services, people who are, you know, involved in trying to craft some kind of Jewish national policy in Poland, one of the big words they use is overpopulation. It's a kind of odd word when you think about it, but one particular uh, government, uh, not government, but, you know, representative to the parliament talks about how Poland has one million too many Jews, meaning one million too many Jews for the resources they have available. So the Jewish community recognizes the burden this puts on the Jewish community and the fact that with everybody doing the same kind of thing in a li and living in concentrated very densely in certain areas, it puts a real strain on people's ability to make a living. Um, the other thing is it's getting young. Now, this is this would have had the war not happened, had the Holocaust not happened, this might have changed because people began to get married later and began to have fewer children. But this was not the case into the 30s. So again, you have what basically is a baby boom and a youth quake, as people like to talk about it in the 60s, uh, with more people living to maturity and a higher birth rate, the population keeps getting younger. And in 1931, 30% of Polish Jews are under the age of 15. And again, this not only, you know, is exacerbated by the strain on communal resources, but given again, the kind of government restriction on economic opportunity that begins to kick in in the late 30s, uh, you have this sense of young people beginning to feel hopeless about what's going on in Poland trapped. Okay, this isn't doom and gloom, but there's a sense of anxiety and distress. And also, predictably, there's a generation gap. With more people living in the cities and young people often going from the shtetlach or the villages to the cities, because there is no economic opportunity in the shtetlach, it's, it's even worse there. Um, well, you know what happens when young people go to the city, there are no parents. Uh, they start to question these traditional structures. Even in the small towns, they start to question traditional structures. Uh, they seek new solutions. They are looking for other answers than their parents can give them. And the political movements we're gonna look at and the cultural movements we're gonna look at definitely feed into this, including of course, all the mass media. So what else is new? By the way, I hope you are enjoying the picture on the right. It's one of my favorites of this young couple. And I always uh, love the idea that uh, they were secret communists and that he was a yeshiva student, but this is like so modern and so cool. Uh, it's really one of my favorite pictures of this period. So I, I hope you know you get a chance to look at it in some detail. Um, the other thing I always notice is when you see women smoking, that's always a sign in photographs that they're emancipated in interwar Germany. Uh, there was a big Jewish women's emancipation movement and uh, a movement just to emancipate women generally. And they're always shown smoking cigarettes. Um, because that was a sign of emancipation. Uh, again, girl with a cigarette. So here are some young people. Take a look at these wonderful photographs. Uh, again, the one in the upper left is a wonderful one. Knowledge is power, unity is power. And here are more young people. This is everywhere. I just, uh, again, you should go back and look at some of these. They're just, uh, just savor them. Uh, the reason I have so many photographs of young people is because there were so many young people. And of course, the youngest. 
the ones born in the 30s, late 20s. Now, what do they do for a living? I said they were having problems. Well, yes, uh, but first you need to know what they did. Uh, they understand too that Poland's Jews are a very important part of Poland's economy. They're not just enmeshed in the economy, they're integral to the economy. Uh, they're engaged in a variety of large and small scale activities that are incredibly important to this economy. Uh, Poland's a developing country and they are important to its development. I have a rundown here from the 31 census of what they did for a living and that just bears out that the bulk of them were doing um, non-farm jobs and also what those non-farm jobs were. And so we'll look at some of this. Uh, and not only that, they were also entrepreneurs. So another important factor in this is that they were able to employ other Polish citizens. So here are some pictures of their occupations. Here we see them as middlemen. Uh, and mi being a middleman is like the quintessential Jewish occupation in interwar Poland. And that could be something very fancy for me, some kind of warehouse or factor or dealer to being a little less fancy, being a shopkeeper, to something not fancy at all, being a vendor and a peddler. So again, I have some lovely photographs here that I hope you will savor uh, all over Poland in different, uh, different points. Shopkeepers, different kinds of shops, small scale, large scale. And then vendors and peddlers. Uh, when people came to Poland to do to photograph uh, photographers from you know Western countries, if you will, uh, not just the United States, but England and France and even Germany, um, they really latched on to these humbler occupations because they were so picturesque. Um, and you have here actually uh, what's interesting here are um, uh, photographs of people doing a, a variety of different more or increasingly more humble, you know, less and increasingly more humble kinds of peddling and vending. Again, from semi-substantial setups in the marketplace, you know, that they set up and then take down uh, to these little stands that they put up and uh, some of the traditional kinds of uh, uh, things that they sell. Uh, what I find very interesting is that there's another photographer here I've got, and you'll see some more of his photographs, Alter Kachizna. Uh, he was actually, um, he was uh, around, well, a little bit around Roman Vishniak's age, probably. Uh, but what's interesting about him is that uh, he too took photographs of poverty-stricken uh, Polish Jews in the interwar period because he was not just a poet and a writer, he was also a photojournalist. He often did commissions for the Jewish Daily Forward in the United States. And often his photographs, even though they covered the same territory, you've got a photograph by Vishniak here, uh, they were far more grainy and far more edgy because what he was into was showing the suffering of the Polish, of the masses and the need from the progressive point of view, the need to alleviate their situation. He wasn't just showing this frozen in piety and poverty. He wasn't savoring the spirituality. He said, something's gotta be done. And his photographs always address that even in the way he photographs them. Um, here we have more peddlers. I just, uh, I have a lot of pictures because there are a lot of peddlers. And again, it's very important to understand the proliferation. You know, I wanted you to see how this proliferates um, and the preponderance of evidence. And of course, uh, you know, for those of you who are into East European Jewish food, here are bagel peddlers. By the way, those bagels don't look like the bagels you get from Epstein's. Um, then of course, there was a great deal of skilled work. Uh, a lot of that had to do with needle trade and some aspects of the clothing or cloth manufacture um, or make, you know, or even smaller scale um, seamstress and tailoring establishments. There was a great deal of that. And if you look at, for example, the skilled workers in Grudno, which is Grudno in Belarus today, um, you will see that out of uh, the Jews are almost, well, they're not quite half, but they're 42% of the population, 43, give or take. Um, and notice how many artisans there are, uh, Jewish artisans versus non-Jewish artisans. That gives you a sense of their integ integralness to the community, to, to the economy of Poland. And the other thing you ought to be seeing and catching on quickly is the idea of women working. Everybody worked, we'll come to that. Here are just other kinds of skilled work and unskilled work. And a lot of people, that was 
one way they kept body and soul together and in a very limited and difficult way. Again, Roman Vishniak does all these photos of, of porters that uh, you know are uh, very lovely looking. Uh, but being a porter means what? It means you, you work with your own body. Uh, your body is the tool. Your body is the, the hauling instrument. Um, and also another thing, because again, uh, of this oddly sort of developed, developing nature in Poland, particularly, well, all over, um, many people didn't have running water for quite a while. And even in, you see some in, into the 30s, in some towns, people still could make a living, or a very small living, but a living, uh, hauling water from the well to people's houses. And another, I have this picture of a woman plucking feathers for down, because that was a very common thing that people did, women in particular. And Alter Kachizno, who took the photo, his comment was, well, it's an honest living. Uh, then there are Jewish entrepreneurs of large and medium scale that employ people in their factories, in their retail establishments, wherever. And there are Jews in the professions. And what you will see, what's interesting, is often the places where Jews work, doctors, for example, and nurses, and dentists, and there are lots of women in this, by the way, women come into medicine, dentistry, and nursing in a big way in this period, Jewish women, are in Jewish hospitals because they cannot work in the state hospitals, which actually helps to feed the large philanthropic hospital, you know, social service establishment that the Jews put together. Um, and then we have teachers. And again, teaching, and you see this also in other parts of Europe, uh, in not just for Jewish women, but other women as well in the interwar period, is a vehicle into the university situation and into the middle class and into a professional situation. So there are teachers in all the various kinds of schools, not public schools. Very few Jews are allowed to teach in public school. But in other kinds of schools, as we will see. Um, but in terms of the net net, they're getting poorer as a community, despite their integral, you know, the integralness of the Jewish community to the, the Polish economy. The depression basically, again, hits Jews, hits Poland hard because it's a developing country. And Jews suffer in turn, not just from the downturn itself, but also from the fact that the downturn exacerbates their demographic situation because they're so concentrated in all these very specific jobs. And second, because it does precipitate attempts to deal with it, with the situation on the part of the Polish Republic by economic and occupational restrictions. And so here again, we have sets of photographs by Alfred Pachisna and also by Roman Vishniak. And you can see the difference. Uh, Roman Vishniak, uh, his comment is, you know, they're very terse. But for Kachizna, he is really, you know, you need to understand the situation. He's looking at the system. That's what, you know, that's, he's always trying to get you to understand what's going on, the plight of the masses. Uh, that's not how Roman Vishniak deals with it. For him, it's very picturesque. I mean, he'll say things like peddlers turned into beggars by the boycott. But what does that even mean? He's not calling anybody to do anything. And here we come to the thing I was talking about, the family economy. Uh, and this is true even before World War I, and I would submit that it's even true across the board for non-Jews as well. Everybody works. Everybody works. Father, mother, children, even children. I don't know if I included a picture of a little boy bagel peddler. There are lots of pictures of children, you know, that I could have included uh, working. But everybody works. There are mom and pop establishments galore. Uh, there are family-owned entrepreneurial businesses, but everyone works. And this is very interesting with respect to Jewish women. There isn't this kind of notion of a conflict between a woman working and the mother, the woman being the, you know, the home haven creator. Women are expected to be entrepreneurial, smart, and exhibit commercial skills, even if those commercial skills are being peddlers. So the view of women is very interesting here. Uh, it's not a separate sphere view the way you see it in the more developed and the more the, the economies where they're more bourgeois, more middle class. 
because a family's survival depends on everyone working, so everyone works. So now we come to the other part, and that's society. Polish Jews are a very diverse group. Unlike Roman Bishniak and, you know, A.J. Heschel, you know, all due respect, uh, they were diverse. They were often in conflict with each other. They had competing visions for the future. And they supported an absolutely breathtaking number of institutions and organizations and services that were all for the community. Partly because it was hard to venture outside the community, not impossible, as you will see, but certainly fraught with some difficulty. And so the Jews created essentially their own civic society with their own network of institutions, organizations, and services. And you can see this notion of multivocality, different voices in the lower right-hand picture. Here is Leibusch Kieski going to Paris, saying goodbye to his family. Uh, probably, I'm assuming, as typical uh, young people, young, you know, young men and women, uh, he is not that young there because of the ghetto, uh, but uh, you know, the hat and all the formal clothing. Uh, but he is going to Paris most likely to study medicine, which is what a lot of uh, Polish young men and women did, uh, Polish Jewish ones, because they couldn't get into the universities. And they would go to other school, you know, to study other or other kinds of professional training. Uh, they would go abroad to do this. And notice his family. They're all quite traditionally orthodox. In fact, I would submit Hasidic. But there he is, the modern young man saying goodbye to his family. That's multivocality. And of course, you always, the basis of any society is the educational system. And because the National Minorities Treaty that Poland had to sign, and because the Polish, kind of, Polish Constitution, um, you know, we, you know, allowed minorities have their own system or allowed Jewish children or minorities children uh, to basically enter public schools um, indiscriminately, right, without discrimination. Uh, basically, we're looking at a very interesting educational situation. The bulk of Polish Jewish children in interwar Poland go to public school for a very simple reason, it's free. It's free. And that too has a significant impact because general, you know, cohort after cohort, if you go back and look at that slide with the age groups, the people born in, um, in the wake of World War I, the people born in the 20s and in the early 30s all go to public school. And what that means is they become habituated to the Polish language, to Polish society, and increasingly, that's going to provide the seeds of a certain level of acculturation. At the same time, they establish their own school systems as well. You can see Jewish run private schools, 20% of Jewish students. Now, what are, what are we talking about? Well, if the National Minorities Treaty says you can have your own educational system in your own national language, my question to you is what's the Jewish national language? Again, the bulk of children go to public schools like these children here. Notice the one up here uh, on the upper left-hand side, we have in, this is in Lviv or Lviv at the time, but Lviv, today Lviv, Ukraine. Um, it's a public school class in a Jewish neighborhood, which means all the kids are Jewish or the bulk of them are. Uh, here is one where I only know of one Jewish child uh, on the lower left-hand side. But that said, most kids go to public school. So again, there's this skewing that will start happening or would have started happening towards more easy integration into the larger society that way. But again, if you ask, if, if you have the school system in your own language, the question is, what is the Jewish language? Well, that depends on who you ask. So what emerges are private school systems for elementary school that are Yiddish language based, like the Seashow, school network, the Central Yiddish School Organization, where everything is taught in Yiddish, including anatomy, like this little anatomy notebook this little girl wrote in Vilnius or Vilna in um, the 1920s. So you can have, a, a, there's a Yiddish language school system that emerges, and it has a kind of leftist socialist leaning because it's the Bundes, the Jewish socialists, who very much support the use of Yiddish because it's the Jewish, it's the, the language of the Jewish masses. 
Um, and so you have the emergence of that. Well, if you're a Zionist, you're not going to agree with that. That's not your national language. That's a diaspora language. It's a Galut language. So for them, it's Hebrew. And guess what? An analogous Tarbut school system, Tarbut means culture, Hebrew culture, it's culture in Hebrew, uh, a Hebrew language school system where, again, you can get an entire education taught to you in Hebrew. Taught to you in Hebrew. And I believe there's some requirement there is uh, to teach the student, you know, to, to also have Polish, like, you know, you have English, right? Um, but that said, the lessons, and these are all accredited by the national school, you know, the centralized school organizations in Warsaw. The national government accredits these schools. Now, for Jews who are more privileged, who are who are heading in a very different direction, and don't want to send their children to private to public school, but also don't want to send their children who can pay the tara. Now, the Tarbut and the um, Seashell schools are supported by massive fundraising campaigns by Jews in America. They're often given grants by the AJDC, the Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so there's some subsidies, but they still charge tuition. But there are people who are well off, who want to send their children to private schools, but private school is not the option necessarily in terms of a Polish private school, because again, there are biases. They establish their own elite Polish language schools at the elementary, the secondary level. And so this is a picture of uh, young children in an elementary school um, in Milets, and they are uh, performing a Midsummer Night's Dream in costume, very interesting. Uh, and this is an elite Polish language private school for Jews, so Jewish Polish language private school. And then of course, what if you are traditionally Orthodox? Those are secular systems. There's no religious instruction there. Now, some people still want to give their children religious instructions, instruction, but send them to other schools. At that point, you know, private schools. There are after school chedorim, Hebrew schools, religious schools, where they can go. And you can see there are some very traditionally restricted gender wise, you know, boys and girls separately, and some more progressive. Uh, look at the more progressive young man who's the teacher. Um, basically, co ed. And then you have, and here we get a really interesting sense of the fragmented nature of the construction of Jewish identity in interwar Poland. Okay, then we have full-time day schools, Jewish day schools, religious ones, Talmud Torah they're called, that teach religious studies and secular studies. So part of the time you're teaching, you know, teaching the traditional religious stuff and then the secular stuff. And they teach the secular language, the secular courses, uh, subjects are taught in Polish, and the other courses are taught in some variety of, uh, in, in Yiddish. Uh, they have non-Zionist ones, which are run by the Agudas Yisrael, which is the non-Zionist religious organization, central religious and political organization um, for boys and girls. And then you have Zionist ones, and not just one kind of Zionist, but two kinds, maybe even three. When it comes to secondary education, again, the issue is public versus private, sort of public Polish language, Polish from the state government, or private Polish language for those who either can't get into because they aren't allowed to because of the level of restriction, so public gymnasium, which is essentially like, kind of like a little bit of middle school and a little bit of high school that we have, um, that would be the next stage. Not everybody went. And I have to tell you, most people stopped going to school, Jews and non-Jews alike, basically by the age of 12 or 13. So seventh grade, as we would have. Because they could. It was legally okay. And because the families needed their income. So. Kids who go to gymnasium, students, young people who go to gymnasium, and you see more of this happening after World War I and really accelerating the interwar period. Um, what you have, uh, people who go to gymnasium uh, either, are, are, you know, come from families that can do without their income, that are 
slightly more, that are more privileged. Or at least I figured out a way to do that. Or if they go to private ones, they have figured out a way to, to get the fees too, to pay the fees. So going to public gymnasium is a possibility if you're allowed in and there's a strict sort of, you know, level of how many Jews they're gonna let in in different ones. Um, and so here you have a young man's uh, gymnasium ID, public. And then private gymnasia are again, sort of this outgrowth for people who, you know, Polish Jews who want to send their children to private school or who couldn't get into the public gymnasium because they wouldn't be allowed to. And so they established their own Polish language private gymnasium. And they're quite elite. As you can see, here's a you know, group of girls literally on the eve of World War II uh, from Warsaw, a very posh girls school in Warsaw, um, going on a trip to Vilna to see the sites and study the history and so on with their Latin teacher, all of whom are usually Jewish. The girls are, and the teachers usually are too. Or this is my favorite one. This is uh, from another gymnasium in Grodno, which again is Grodno today in Belarus, uh, which is a wonderful picture of, you know, typical teenagers, you know, uh, going to a, a, a posh gymnasium where they uh, teach uh, in Polish and Russian. And uh, they really look so real, so typical. Uh, they remind me again of the girls smoking. You know, they're, look at the way they're looking at each other and, you know, looking at the camera. It's a wonderful photo. Um, then there are, again, Sisho and Tarbut run their own gymnasia that are Yiddish language and Hebrew language. And then there is a host of vocational and trade and technical schools run under Jewish auspices. Because again, it's hard for Jewish students to get into the others. And because this, a lot of these are subsidized either by the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, which again are American Jews, or the or ORT, uh, which is a, a, an international and Amer also an American organization to set up vocational training. Um, and then we come to the universities. Uh, and they're enrolled in Polish universities in numbers that are way outweigh their, uh, you know, proportion in the population. They're represented over much, you know, a great deal. Uh, so you can see, in the 20s, a third of all students entering Polish universities are Jewish. Now this falls a bit in the 30s because the restrictions kick in. And again, as far as women are concerned, and you see this pattern in other countries as well, Germany, Austria, the United States, in the interwar period, uh, women, Jewish women, enter universities in greater proportion than non-Jewish women. And here you have some, you know, picture of the ratios of, of you know, students and so on and so forth. I do love these pictures of university students. Um, I love my KU students, but nobody dresses like that. I don't think I dressed like that when I went to Brooklyn College. So clearly, you know, this is uh, very much the past. They look lovely though. Um, now, the community. Uh, the community, uh, by this I mean the official Jewish community. Uh, in order to sustain the kinds of organizations I'm going to show you now, the Network of Social Services, and also the CSO schools, the Tarbut schools, all of these things that are coming, you know, being put together in interwar Poland uh, in terms of, you know, in service of the construction of Jewish identity as well. Uh, there's a community structure that exists in Poland, in interwar Poland, that's very interesting. Um, and so what you're looking at here is the uh, a very centralized, professionalized social service network that is administrated by community councils called the Kahila in each community. Kahila, like Kahal congregation, Kahila is the Jewish community council, and every town and city in Poland had its Jewish community council. You elected their members. It used to be they were an appointed oligarchy, but after World War II, that World War I that changed. Um, and so from the 1920s on, uh, basically it, they're elected by male suffrage. Interestingly, you know, there's universal suffrage in poor Poland for the government, but in the Jewish community, no matter how women agitate, with very few exceptions, community by community, it's male suffrage. Jewish men elect their community council representatives, their Kahila representatives. 
And so, of course, women's issues are not attended to. A couple of places are different, notably Bialystok and Vilna. Vilna. And you can see the picture here of, uh, this is the uh, 1920s in Vilna. And you can see pictures here of the community council members. And you can see quite a number of women, uh, granted not proportionate to their representation of the population, but still. Now, these community councils, these killers, basically acted as liaisons to all the different social services. Among the most important social services are the free loan societies, because these advance interest-free loans to businesses and individuals to pay for a host of needs. And people are expected to repay the loan in full, but what happens after World War I is that this becomes a, a more, uh, what shall I say, uh, well-organized process because like many other social services that often were basically before World War I were provided community by community varying from locality to locality, all of this gets centralized because of the influx of international money. And so you have essentially a professionalization of all these approaches. So here we have a nice uh, picture of various uh, aspects of the Gemilis Chesed Kassas, as they're called, the free loan societies. And you can see again in the upper right-hand picture, of the upper left-hand picture, the in Kolbushova, Kolbushova, uh, the um, diverse nature of that particular director of the free loan societies. Um, and then, of course, there are health and welfare services. Again, organized by the communities, administrated centrally, and, you know, also the workers, you know, they were also the, the employees of these different social services are also subject to professionalization. One of the most important ones is, is TOZ, T-O-Z, uh, which is the uh, Society for the Safeguarding of Health of the Jewish Population. Uh, and it's very important because it provides clinics, it provides daycare centers, it provides food subsidies to poor children, uh, it provides nursing services, uh, and, and summer camps as well. Again, with the family economy and everybody working, there are some very small children that need attending to. There are also children of school age who need daycare from time to time. And there are also children in the summer it's a way of them getting away from the city for the summer and having a salubrious experience. And notice too the numbers of women employed, not just as you know, sort of obviously as you know, workers in a daycare center, but as professionals. Um, you have orphanages. The Chantos runs a network of orphanages. Again, it used to be locality by locality. Now everything is run centrally and the localities now become parts of these organizations. And again, to provide care for not just orphans, but also children whose parents work all the time and who themselves don't work, but who need to be taken care of, and particularly in the summer. Um, so how's all this paid for? Well, I've already alluded to it. Money from overseas is big. The American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee is of great importance. Uh, they, they funnel vast amounts of money into Poland through fundraising in the United States among American Jews. And in the interwar period, American Jews develop a, have, have developed a real sense of official organized responsibility. Really in the wake of, you know, in the wake of the upheavals of World War I, even before Poland's a republic. And of course, the the JDC does work all over, not just in, in Europe, but in other places as well. Uh, so you have that. Uh, you also have ORT, and that's the acronym for the Russian, it's for the Russian translation of this Society for Trades and Agricultural Labor. And their goal is to make sure that people can earn a living. They run trade schools, they subsidize all those trade schools, they um, go into towns and do workshops on how to do things and so on and so forth. Um, and then you have something very interesting, the American Landsmannschaft. Now, what are those? A Landsmannschaft, Landsmann means um, countryman, country person, you know, a homie, if you will. 
Uh, and American Landsmannschaften were organizations that were created by American, by, by East European immigrants from the Russian empire, from the heartland, if you will, um, in the United States at the turn of the 20th century when that big immigration took place at the end of the 19th and the turn of the 20th, when this gigantic immigration took place. And they started these organizations based on the towns they came from, the town of Zabludov, the town of Bezhiny, uh, the town of, uh, what do we have here? Wuj, okay, uh, Wuj being such a big city, there are probably many of them, in fact, I can tell by the name, there must be one of several. Uh, but what you have essentially is people from the same little town got together. Why? Their first thing was to start a, uh, enough to raise money to buy a plot in a cemetery so they could buy the burial. Because in, in Europe, you know, in Poland, in Russia, wherever, people got buried in the, uh, you know, there was a community graveyard, a Jewish graveyard. Well, they didn't, these things didn't exist in the United States. So they created their own communities. And then their first task was to create, to buy land and uh, create a cemetery. They also would get together to build synagogues or at least start religious congregations and so on and so forth. But in the 1920s and 30s, as the American Jewish community got more prosperous, what you saw was something very different. Uh, they started feeling responsibility for their old, the people they'd left behind in their old hometown. And they began officially, you know, unofficially, you know, personally, and officially to start supporting them. And so a lot of their work at this point, these pictures you see, is to support the institutions of their particular towns. And the people in the towns were very savvy because they would then write to the different, you know, newsletters of the Landsmannschaften saying, well, we've done this and look at what we've done with your money because this way more money came. And often people would come to visit and to see what happened. So this connection with the American Jews from town to town, a little more personal and more decentralized, was also a very important source of income. And then you had local fundraising. Women were hugely involved in the social service process and therefore were involved as volunteers and professionals in a host of activities, fundraising, some of the very tr traditional things like the old visiting the old societies, but also women were involved in hospital societies. They were involved in raising money for hospitals, raising money for schools, you name it. Uh, the, one of the towns, I said, bulk of this that I was looking at in one of the ones in my dissertation, they actually had a social calendar every week and they would tell you all the stuff going on in the town, you know, and so on. Uh, you know, we're fundraising for this on Monday, or we're fundraising for this on Tuesday, and uh, Thursday is going to be this a party or this ball, and we're going to do this sort of thing and so on to raise money for another cause. Um, similarly, young people got involved because for young people, particularly the slightly better healed ones, the more middle class ones, even in the small towns, uh, this was a fun social activity. You know, sort of like community service, basically. So lots of these nice pictures of young people. I have about 50 or 60. Um, and then we come and, you know, uh, hang on, we're getting there. Um, and we come to the culture, cultural trends, if you will. And here again, we come back to language. Three languages, Hebrew, Polish, and Yiddish. Hebrew never catches on. Uh, despite this taboo system, uh, despite the school system and so on, Hebrew just doesn't catch on in the same way. And Zionism is a very big thing, but Hebrew is not the thing that attracts people to Zionism. Polish is beginning to come into its own. As I said, more and more people are educated in Polish public schools, uh, which means that Polish is the, the language of where their comfort level is. Uh, and then of course, but the big thing, the classic thing, the, the golden thing was Yiddish. Yiddish was prime. Yiddish was the language. And it's Yiddish that really becomes a literate scholarly language with a significant body of work. And this little map here I have for you uh, on this slide is very interesting because if you look at the little blue edges, you can see where the Yiddish speaking areas are and how much of them there are. But to start with Polish, uh, these are not just the only two Polish language periodicals directed towards Jews of Jewish interest. There are many others, but these are the two I was able to get pictures of, so this is what I wanted to show you. Uh, they're published uh, by the, one is published by, uh, well, they're both published by the Oppenslots. Um, Nathan, the husband, publishes Nash Kezlan, 
and uh, the wife uh, publishes Ava, uh, which is a, a weekly magazine for women. Um, and so Paulina Appenschlaka publishes that. Uh, and as you can see, they have a kind of Zionistic bent, uh, but again, they're intended to be popular. Uh, this is a weekly magazine. Nash Piedland actually is a daily. Um, and the readership isn't huge, but it's, it, there are more like this and they are coming into their own or they're beginning to, they're beginning to make a start. Uh, and you can see that uh, if you look at what the kinds of articles, uh, the front page of this magazine, Ava, uh, the weekly, the women's weekly magazine, uh, apart from Zionists, and again, they have a Zionist spin to them, uh, they have a very secular agenda. They talk about women's issues like abortion rights, uh, gender equality, women's rights. Uh, so this is interesting and done in Polish for Jews. And that's an important thing. But Yiddish literacy is punk. Everybody reads Yiddish, or at least, the, uh, you know. And again, in the Polish census of 1931, the bulk of Jews said Yiddish was their mother tongue. Because the Polish census of 31 was doing mother tongues. So, you know, you, you, you identified by mother tongue because they were trying to figure out who the minorities are. Uh, and you can see different types of people all read Yiddish. And there's a thriving Yiddish press. Heint today is the largest daily Yiddish paper that's published uh, and circulates throughout Poland. And this is from May 30th, 1939. And you can go back, hopefully, if you want to visit, you know, revisit with YouTube, with YouTube. And you can see that they're concerned with a host of current pressing current affairs that are relevant to the Jews, particularly, look at the date, 39 what's happening vis-a-vis -vis the Axis powers. More pictures of the different newspapers. And you can see what's happening here. For a lot of people, they're starting to do, look at the upper left-hand side. Uh, this is Zeit. It's a, a Vilno paper, Vilnius. Um, and Zeit means time. Um, and what's interesting is, on the one hand, you see the Hebrew letters. Yiddish is spelled in Hebrew letters. And on the other hand, on the other side, you see Polish orthography. If you read Polish, you know this says site, which means a lot of people, which I know for a fact, will be coming increasingly more comfortable reading Yiddish with Polish orthography. There were also there was also a thriving art scene with respect to Yiddish. You know, poetry, journalism, not journalism, poetry, social criticism, novels. And here are some of the different involvements. And, and you also see early, you know, very quickly, a kind of Vilna Warsaw divide. Vilna is a mammoth cultural center. It's in really Vilnius, Vilno uh, is Lithuanian, but uh, it was in Poland in the interwar period as part of Poland. And uh, there's a kind of rivalry between Vilno and um, Warsaw uh, for primacy in many things Yiddish, uh, including literature, and as you can see, drama. Uh, they're, the, they're the two big poles of Jewish culture in Poland, if you will, pardon the pun. And so here's just some pictures of these. And these are all avant-garde. They're very secular. They're all cutting edge. They're into graphics. They're into photography. There's Alta Kachizna. And there's his wife, too, up there, somewhere down there. Um, again, it's, it's remarkably abstract, abstract expressionism, all avant-garde. And then there's scholarship. The Evo Institute for Jewish Research, where I did uh, my dissertation research, was really uh, preceded by its grandfather, its father, uh, its parent, I should say, uh, was the Jewish the Yiddish Scientific Institute that was founded in Vilna in 1925. And its goal was to create a body of Jewish scholarship in Yiddish and to study Jewish history in Poland in the most up-to-date way, including collecting archival material, collecting oral testimonies, uh, offering Yiddish language courses for teachers of Yiddish uh, in the Yiddish school system, and standards of Yiddish spelling and translation. And in fact, those are still used today in the United States. For example, the Yiddish spelling and translation I used to do when I was doing all of this 
uh, was according to how Yugo did it, because that's what I did my, my studying. And again, you see a significant involvement of women. Obviously, I'm not talking, you know, in terms of, you know, but you see, this is very much a modern secular undertaking. In fact, if you look at the bottom, the lower left-hand side, you see, you see Lucy Davidovich, who actually studied at Evo. She was an aspirant. She was a research fellow at Evo um, in the interwar period. Uh, in Warsaw, not to be outdone, there is the Jewish, the Institute for Judaic Studies, uh, which today is, uh, now YIVO exists in the United States as YIVO. Uh, the Institute of Judaic Studies now is the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw. Uh, they opened essentially in the same, for the, some of the same purposes, uh, especially they had a, a vast and phenomenal library that was attached to, to the, Jew, the Institute of Judaic Studies. Um, and it was right in, you know, near the Tlamatsky Synagogue that had been destroyed, was destroyed as I showed in the first picture uh, by the Germans. Um, but it was an extremely important uh, repository of historical scholarship. I have some four of the main historians there. Note the dates, none of them survived the Holocaust. Um, but in any case, uh, the Institute for Judaic Studies was the opposite of Evo. It was the, uh, the, the polar, the other pole, if you will. And what's interesting is that they used to tell me Evo because I knew many of the uh, people, my, my dissertation advisor among them, uh, were people who had lived in Vilna before the war. And they told me that the people would get on buses on Saturday at, uh, you know, in Vilna and go to Warsaw to throw stones at the uh, Jewish, uh, the Institute for Jewish Studies because their Yiddish was different. Uh, and Yivo was fighting for primacy, just a cute story. Um, okay, there's a Yiddish theater. And this is not just a Yiddish theater that does, you know, Yiddish things. They do translations of theater, uh, you know, Shakespeare and so on, Koenig Lear. Uh, they did one of the Tevye the Dairyman, Fiddler on the Roof, you know, based on the, uh, but that wasn't Fiddler on the Roof, it was Tevye the Dairyman. Um, and also, uh, there was a connection between the Yiddish theater and the United States, uh, because many songs and, and musicals that were, you know, uh, or plays uh, of Yiddish import or Yiddish content, uh, that Jewish content that uh, were done in Poland often were sent overseas and uh, overseas ones were sent here uh, to, to, um, to Poland. And what's fascinating too is like the songs that uh, people often think of as typical old shtetl Jewish songs are actually Yiddish theater songs. Um, so, uh, and again, there's the Vilna troupe. Um, and then there's also the uh, Warsaw Yiddish Art Theater. Uh, and again, a, a sort of different, you know, the two different capitals of Jewish culture. Uh, and also, there was coming a cinema. They were starting to do really cool movies. Uh, a lot of musical comedy, because people like that. It's the Depression, after all. Uh, Molly Pecon, who I don't know if you, how many of you know about her, but she was the one who played the um, Yentl, uh, Yentl the Matchmaker. Yes, Yentl the Matchmaker in Fiddler on the Roof. That's Molly Pecon. She started out on the Yiddish stage in the United States. And um, they periodically sent her to Poland, uh, where she got involved in movies. Uh, and also doing theater there because they wanted her Yiddish, her Yiddish sounding, you know, her Yiddish accent to not become Americanized, to sound pure, so to speak. Uh, and there was also a very serious drama that you start seeing at the end of this period, uh, including one, a very famous one, Gleena Filda, that uh, wins the uh, kind of like a best foreign film award for, you know, some of the equivalent of the Academy Awards in France. So kind of nice. Um, and finally, is politics. Polish jury was highly politicized. Whether that did them any good or not, I mean, you know, who knows? But, I mean, in terms of, you know, would have done them any good. Uh, but it was highly politicized. And politics informs everything, including how you construct your identity, including the language you speak, right? Zion, you know, language you think should be the Jewish language. Um, Hebrew or Pol Hebrew or Yiddish or Polish, I mean, all of this. And young people become much more politically affiliated than their elders for the simple reason that for them, particularly the youth groups that are attendant on these political movements, give them a place to go. I told you there's a youth place, there's a generation gap. Well, here they can find a peer group, a home away from home. Here they can find 
significant others. And here they can find adults who are not parents who can be mentors or not mentors. And people took their votes very seriously. And you can see in towns like Vilna, which are highly progressive in terms of the multiplicity of political expression, you have even a woman's slate running in the city municipal elections, the proper ones, the proper city municipal council, city council, um, and a Jewish woman's slate. Um, but it was also, as I said, diverse and fragmented. Differences exist between different types of Jews, you know, different types of uh, political orientation, and even within the orientations as you're going to see. It's a very charged scene. This is a picture of the Jewish representatives, eight of them, to the first parliament. And you can see how diverse they are. I give you their party affiliation. Focus is like a, 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 an early socialist, Jewish socialist. So the first type of political expression is left-wing socialism, the Bund, the General Jewish Workers Union of Lithuania, Poland, and Russia. Now, this was founded before the First World War, uh, but it is very big in Poland, particularly among adults. Now, 99,000 members doesn't sound like a lot because it's a big population, but think of all the other parties. Um, it was certainly the largest single party in terms of population, adult population. Uh, but what's interesting about it is that their belief, what is their belief? They, they are socialists. They believe in the Jewish masses. They believe in uplifting the Jewish masses. They believe in ameliorating the condition of the Jewish masses and all that good stuff, the working class and so on and so forth. But they call for sheerness, doyakite, sheer. Uh, Jewish problems have to be addressed and resolved here and now in Poland because of the Jewish history in Poland of the fact that the diaspora is our home. And they have to be addressed in Yiddish in terms of political and cultural activism. And you can see on, on the, in the poster on the right that they're concerned with, they see themselves as acting on behalf of the masses against the other organized Jewish interests, including Zionism. And the Bund, again, supports youth activities, political parties, I mean, youth activities, and a variety of youth groups. And it's, it's, uh, there are young youth groups for like the kids below of school age. And then there are youth groups for the teenagers and the young adults. And that one is called Tukum, the future. The future. Uh, and this is very important, again, because for all of the political parties, the youth groups become a real vehicle of propagation. Uh, they have, and the other thing that's striking about all the political, Jewish political parties is you can live the political life, the Bund life, the Zionist life, the Agudist Israel life, birth to earth. They provide facilities and they provide institutions and they provide outlets for different stages of life, including young people's sports activities and literary expression. Zionism, which is in effect Jewish nationalism, uh, also is important in Poland. And it's beginning to gain on the Bund, especially among young people. And Zionist parties and programs and the youth groups and all that good stuff are very important in interwar Poland. But the problem with the Zionists is that there's not just one kind of Zionist. There's only one Bund. But look at, now this is just a small, a small group. In the town I studied, in Volkovis, one of the towns I studied, there were something like 21 Zionist groups for a Jewish population that was not 21,000. There was only about 9,000 or so. 21 Zionist groups. Now I'm fudging here because some of them were women's auxiliaries and some of them were youth groups, but still. And this is just a small smattering. You can see they go across the spectrum politically from the right, the, poly, the left, I'm sorry, the Polizio, the labor Zionist, to the religious labor Zionist, to the general Zionist, to the Mizrahi, the religious Zionists regular, to the revisionisten, which are the right-wing ultra-national Zionists. And again, most important, particularly with respect to Zionism, are the youth groups. 
So when you look at people, young people's affiliations, those that become affiliated, largely they're Zionists. And so here are some of the different Zionist youth groups. Hashem HaTzair is left wing. Beitar is right wing. And here are various other Zionist youth groups from other Zionist parties with different orientations, including a mandolin band for the socialist Zionists. I like that, left wing labor Zionist mandolins. And they even had the Maccabi sports movement, which many of you may be familiar with, which still exists. Basketball teams and soccer teams and competitions, both in Poland and outside of Poland. And then the religious non-Zionists not only had their own political party, the Adventists for Ail, but they supported their own social network, including the uh, Tsiri Agudas Royal Boys Youth Group and the Benot Agudas Royal Girls Youth Group. And even more importantly, they were very important. They were a very significant Jewish party in the Polish parliament. Why? Because a lot of Jews who were not necessarily traditionally Orthodox anymore, whose traditional Orthodox is beginning to wane, still supported the more traditional parties. This shouldn't come as a surprise. So finally, my conclusions. And as usual, I've got a few. The last days, the real conclusion, which is to say the conclusion of our history here. As World War One, a uh, World War Two, you know, was beginning to loom in the months before the really more like the nine months leading up to World War Two. Poland began to conscript men. Now I said they had actually they had they've always had a conscription. They would conscript. They tried about two hundred thousand young men a year into the military, you know, draft age, and you had to register for the draft and everything. That's why I said so many young Jewish men served. Um, but they upped that. They, they I think they brought in a million. They conscripted a million men. Yes, I do have there, and about a hundred thousand. And so here again, another generation of young men in uniform. So that's one thing. And then, even before this, as as early as the early thirties, Poland was beginning to think in terms of well, it had started doing it even before then, but. Poland was seriously upgrading its military capabilities. Among those capabilities, upgrading and modernizing its air force. And a sort of civilian defense organization to support that, to support all the needs of aviation and so on, emerged with bipartisan Jewish and non-Jewish involvement, not just in working it, but also in supporting it. LOPP is the acronym. And of course, as things got more and more frightening, particularly if you look at the date, the two dates here, one the date the war started, one the date a week, a few days after the uh, German-Soviet non-aggression pact, which everybody understood meant Poland was gonna be caught in the war. Uh, everybody tried to mend their fences. The, the, the government reaches out to the Jews to bring them in with expressions of unity, of positiveness towards the Jews, and for by their token, the Jewish parliamentary members who come together in a block, so to speak, like a caucus, say the same thing. And as they say in Nash Piedzwan, which is the Polish language Jewish newspaper, in the twinkle of an eye, all religious and national differences were obliterated. Well, it's pretty to think so. But here are my last words. Um, I won't read this whole thing to you. Don't be afraid. But again, with me, it's on the one hand and on the other hand. And on the one hand, it's easy to say, to be dewy-eyed about this, all these wonderful dynamic things that were going on with respect to the Jewish community. But we have to temper that. The Jews were poor. They were economically important. They were enmeshed in the economy, but they were impoverished. And it wasn't clear how getting out of that was going to happen. And in terms of society and political culture, 
the problem Jewish leaders struggled for, you know, giving Jews, you know, struggled to get more rights for the Jews, to fight the anti-Semitic agenda, to, uh, you know, formulate a positive national Jewish agenda that they could work. Uh, but the internal divisions and the external barriers were not getting overcome as well as they should have been, or could have been. I don't know. I shouldn't say could have been. But they weren't. They were, it, this was hard work and it was still very uphold. And as far as Jewish identity was concerned, there were so many options. And all of those options fought with each other. I mean, Jews were, as I said, beginning to acculturate, beginning to Polonize, but they were doing it very slowly. And mostly at, the, at that point for the privilege. The more activist, the less privileged. Those who were involved in that side, those who had strong desires for a non-Polish national identity, a non-acculturated national identity. Their problem was their utopian ideas were tempered by some of this beginning Polonization and also by the economic, social, and political realities. As I said, Jewish school systems exist, but most Jewish kids go to public school. And orthodoxy is declining, but look, they're very strong politically. They still get voted in. So their agenda is still on the burners. Zionism is an important movement, but it's not monolithic. And really, when, it come, when you come down to it, all these isms became powerless to deal with what was coming at them. And even with what was happening in Poland to some degree. It was hard work in Poland and it was going to be impossible work after Poland. But that said, this was a vital and dynamic community. It was a community that was in the process of being born, of transforming itself, of looking to the wider world in new ways. They had no idea what was coming at them. You couldn't connect that. It didn't connect to their history. It didn't connect to their culture or the world they were building. They were not living on the edge of destruction, at least not in their eyes. In their eyes, they were truly cities of boundless possibilities for good or ill and headed as the Bund used to say, into the future. How this would have worked, who knows, because we'll never know. Thank you. I'm grateful that you stayed this long and I hope you did. And I'm willing to welcome questions and happy to. Thank you, Dr. Sternberg, for that excellent presentation. I always, as Jessica said, always learn something new, and it's um, a pleasure to learn from you every time. Um, if you, anyone has questions, please put them in the chat. Um, I'll ask them as I get them and throw a few in here. First, I wonder if you might speak to why we have so many misconceptions as you presented this, you know, very complicated, complex community why do we have so many misconceptions that we, you know, want to maybe paint this community with a, you know, one brush or only see them um, in terms of destruction? Well, you know, it's, that's an interesting question. Uh, I was, I, you know, I addressed it a little bit, you know, at the beginning. Um, I think it really has to do with the fact, and, and I used to, we used to confront this at Evo all the time. It has to do with the fact that it's hard to see this community in terms of people fighting with each other, you know, people struggling with each other people having real animosities and antipathies about different opinions and ideologies, because we, the idea that, you know, we want to see them as having had this wonderful utopian society that was cut down brutally in the Holocaust. But to me, you know, and it's a very natural, I can't describe it better, I wish I could. It's a natural reaction to romanticize and sentimentalize that which was killed in such an abrupt way. And, and the other thing that's important to understand is that for American Jews particularly, the American Jewish community. Um, the Holocaust, well, once the war, Second World War was over and they started looking at what happened, it left the American Jews completely gobsmacked because what we had come to rely on here in this country was that the real Jews were there. 
This was the Jewish heartland, the ancestral homeland. And that had been, you know, destroyed in a way that it could never be resurrected. And American Jews had to therefore come, sort of step up to the plate and not just be the funders, right? They were comfortable with that. In fact, it was in many ways, one of their secular religious ethics, if you will, to give money, to collect philanthropy, to give tzedakah. Uh, but now they had to also be cultural repositories. And they had to literally rebuild that from scratch. And I think what happened as a consequence was that this community, they could not accept a realistic view of this community. They had to eulogize it. And they had to create this kind of, you know, idealize it. Because they really had not basically developed, you know, any other way of connecting. I've had a few questions on the topic of anti-Semitism, and I wonder if you might speak a little bit to how, I mean, you alluded to this um, earlier as well, but how what they were experiencing uh, in this period differed from earlier periods, and maybe if there was a, gener a difference in generational response to the anti-Semitism that um, yes, was that happening in the war period. It's a that's a good that's a good point. There was a difference, and if you go back through the PowerPoint, you know, hopefully, as I said, you said it would be on YouTube, so you can all go back and look at it if you're so inclined. Uh, but uh, you will see, you know, two things. Uh, the Pshitik Pogrom was preceded by some activity on part of the Jewish Self Defense Group, uh, and they had guns. Now, I'm not saying that's a great sign of anything. I'm just saying that the younger generation was very willing to step up and confront anti-Semitism in a variety of ways. There's another one, uh, uh, the, there's another picture that I should direct your attention to, and that is in the one where the young man and woman are smoking cigarettes in her room. Uh, but the, there's another picture there of a group of young people in Warsaw at a very significant protest of anti-Semitism in the universities. So in fact, ironically, the Polish Republic was responsible for uh, level of very uncomfortable anti-Semitism, at least again by American standards, it was would have been horrific. Um, but on the other hand, it allowed these protests. It allowed people to, you know, um, try to deal with it in various ways. Sometimes they cracked down, sometimes they didn't. But the thing that's interesting is this, this existed. And so yes, younger people more so than older people would take this kind of direct confrontative position. The older generation also dealt with it. I mean, all this business about the Jewish national agenda, Jewish representation in the parliament, all had to do with creating a Jewish presence. One of the tragedies, not just for Jews, but for all the national minorities, I have not talked about Ukrainians or Belarusians, particularly Ukrainians who got a really bad deal from the government, uh, but Belarusians and Ukrainians um, and Lithuanians, the other national minorities, the tragedy is they never got together in a proper national minorities bloc. Then something could have been accomplished. Uh, because again, the Polish government was certainly not willing to just lay back and accept all this lovely national minority stuff, you know, and, and not push Polonization. They very much wanted Polish to be the ethnic majority and, and in a real way. Uh, and the Ukrainians, uh, there was a point in, the, in Ukraine where they closed a bunch of the universities for protests for a long time. And there were other situations as well. So the, the, the thing is, A, the Jews never got together in a Jewish bloc. And B, all the minorities never got together in a Jewish block. And that's a function of how they saw, the older generation saw themselves. And just to connect then looking forward to what will become Nazi anti-Semitism, um, is there, what connection can we draw from the way Poles are expressing anti-Semitism versus then when the Nazis come in and maybe their willingness to participate? That's, that's a very complicated situation. And I have to preface this by really two things. Well, not preface it, but I, I have to respond to it in two, in two ways or from two points of view. Number one, um, and I think I mentioned this in our conversation before the presentation, uh, people forget that all over Europe in the interwar period, there were very few democracies. Uh, you know, real ones, you know, or, or constitutional monarchies with a democratic framework. So we're looking at France, we're looking at Czechoslovakia, you know what happened to Czechoslovakia. Uh, we're looking at uh, the Low Countries, uh, and we're looking at, well, forget England, because England's across the channel, I'm not worrying about England. But those are the countries. And if you, I have, I, you know, if you look at a map of Europe, I, I can point out to you that it, it's really top heavy with autocracies, presidents for life. Uh, so 
And Poland's no exception, as you can see. Two minutes into the Republic, they have a president for life. Okay, he doesn't live that long, but still he's a president for life. And he sets up a situation where you don't really get a thoroughgoing return to democratic institutions in a real way. All right, they're there um, and they exist, but they are constantly under the gun. Uh, so there's that. Um, uh, the other thing too uh, uh, about Poland uh, or about you know the way anti-Semitism functions. So there's that. So people do not have in the interwar period an experience of a truly democratic consensus and yada yada. Uh, then there are the conditions of German occupation. When the Germans come in, uh, you know, the Poles have the large, you know, half, the Poles lose 6 million people in the Second World War, of which 3 million are Jews. Granted, you know, that's why. But that said, living under German occupation for the Poles is a very horrific process too. And that aspect of it also would make them very reluctant to, you know, behave in any overtly positive way towards Jews. That said, the other thing you need to keep in mind is that in parts of Poland, this tradition of antipathy is definitely there at the grassroots level. You know, more so in some places, less so in other places. Um, but coming forward in aid of Jews in Eastern Europe is a very problematic proposition. And, you know, you have to really think twice about how far you want to condemn all of that. Yeah, complicated indeed. Um, and finally, I know that at least for me, one of the best parts of your presentations are always the visuals that you use. You have a, oh, wow. um, an incredible repository of, of photographs. And I wonder if you might speak a little bit to how you selected them, how they might've been preserved and, and the importance of, of seeing these photographs. Well, a lot of the photographs, I, 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 if you go through it, you'll see, I did give credit to MCAG, uh, but um, basically the, uh, the, the photograph collections I use, come from the, uh, is, my, is my sound okay? I'm having yeah. trouble, oh, okay. They come from the um, the Holocaust Museum and from MCHE, thank you. And also from a lot of uh, different collections like Evo and so on. As to where they get them, again, we have some interesting things. As I said, there's Roman Vishniak, there's Alter Kachizna, Kach and they come to their photography from two very different points of view. And then you have a lot of the stuff that's given to MCHE or to the museum and so on is really our family photographs. And when you look at them with, and, oh, and the other types of photographs are photographs done by the various organizations to tout what they do. And some of the photographs, particularly the social service, uh, you know, activities are done for the benefit, for the, uh, benefit of the benefactors to show the benefactors look what we're doing and now let's you know keep keep you know and also your money's being well spent so they they they're they're very different from the ones for example in the Auschwitz album which I talked about from a very different perspective so people are why I like these photographs is they're done with pride you know people are pleased with themselves I love that photograph of the young, you know, Leal Shu, the young gymnasium students, you know, that group of boys and girls. They're just so pleased. They're so young. They're so alive. And, and so these are all the kind of photographs you might find, you know, you, like my, my sense of that photograph is like selfies. You know, it's the kind of thing kids would take. Uh, and so, so you have, it, they're very human, these photographs. And so the ones, and largely because we get them from families and we get them from institutions that are proud of their work or that want to record what's going on so that we all know what's going on. Um, that's basically what I can say about them at this point. And there's more actually that can be said. One other thing too, is if you, a lot of the pictures of Isiskis, Isishuk or Is, well, Isiskis uh, or Isiski, uh, come from the Tower of Pictures at the Holocaust Museum, which are pictures from one town that were collected by the museum in the interwar, that were taken in the interwar period by one photographer, uh, the mother of uh, Yako, the grandmother of Yako Liak. Um, who was the town photographer. And so again, you have this, it's a, a, a different way of the, the cameras are more, it's all more personal and more proud. Is it a fair assumption to say that the majority of the people we're looking at in these photographs did not survive the Holocaust? Oh, absolutely. Um, there, uh, you know, when you start looking at pictures of all the children, you know they didn't. 
the majority, this whole, that's why if you saw at the beginning of that, that picture of the cohorts, you know, with that, that graph of the cohorts, I had the Holocaust as a bar across because everything comes to an end in the Holocaust. And when you realize that less than 200,000 Jews survived in Poland, fewer than 200,000 Jews, you're looking at situations where people come back to towns and the towns are virtually empty because the Jews were the bulk of the town. So it, it, it's, you know, there's an emptiness that is so clear from these pictures. I mean, you're looking at, and when you look at life right up literally to the bridge of the Holocaust, right, right to the cusp of the Holocaust, and it's still going on. That's what's so amazing to me. And, and you know, the diversity gets a really bad rap because people aren't willing to cope with some of the more, you know, problematic nature aspects of the diversity. Um, you know, even the cute thing about people going from Vilna to Warsaw to throw stones at the research institute. Uh, you know, people just go, how, you know, what a thing to say. But they, they were alive. That's what they did. Thank you again for this well, thank um, you great for presentation you. and helping us, yeah, really see the diversity and vibrancy um, of this community and seeing how people lived um, rather than just the means of their death when we often think Absolutely. about this. Um, Absolutely. It outweighs their death. It really does. It really does. Thank you again for having me. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. And um, I hope all of you join us. If you want to, um, as we mentioned, we will have this up on our YouTube channel and also posted on our website, mchekc.org. So if you'd like to go back and take another look at those slides, you absolutely can. I hope you join us for our next presentation on Zoom. Uh, this one is August 2nd at 2 p.m. in the afternoon, Central Standard Time. It's Gerhard uh, Baumgartner talking about the Roma experience in the Holocaust. So it should be a very interesting presentation. Um, thank you for joining us and thank you to our partners at Union Station. Have a good night, everyone.